So I'm Alessia Ryan, I'm a uh, Principal Consultant at Proxima and I'll be helping to facilitate the conversation today. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Tanya and Charmaine. Um, they're going to be joining the, um, the panel to really share their experiences, their thoughts and their inputs around the, the topic of women in pharma procurement. So on that note, if I can ask my, um, my esteemed colleagues to briefly introduce themselves and then to share with the rest of the group why does this matter to you? What are what are kind of the, the key insights, stories that you may have that you want to share um, that, that others may recognise that might ring true around our experience within the uh, pharma procurement industry? So, Charmaine, should we kick off with yourself? Sure. So, I'm the subcategory lead for online media and data at Bayer. And uh, why this is important to me is because quite for some time we haven't spoken about uh, institutionalized privilege and why women are disadvantaged we're, we're constantly the narrative is always, always about how women need to do better and why this is important to me is i want to amplify the voices of women women are great they have so much talent so many areas in which they are uh, fabulous and i think that quite often um, ignored. And so this is why this is important for me. And a little story that I have is um, I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm a, a big champion of, of g &I within within the Bayer organization. And um, quite often I'm asked to do um, kind of sessions with the with leadership teams, like fairly, fairly senior people. And um, and I share with them a video on, uh, on it's, it's called Brown Eyed, Blue Eyed. And it's um, a video by Jane Elliott. And it talks about how, how you can affect someone's performance within about 15 minutes by 50%. And it's very interesting seeing the gasps on people's faces when they hear that and they see this experiment and I show them a little video. Um, and, and that's what's really inspired me to really drive this forward to, to make sure that um, all leaders understand that they are having a direct impact on the performance of women and so that it's important that they understand institutionalized privilege um, or disadvantage when it comes to women. Thank you, that was really, really helpful. And, and Tanya, can we hear, hear your thoughts around, but first of all, of course, an introduction um, and then your experience of, of the industry. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to be here. Actually, I know a bunch of people in the call, so thanks for showing up. Uh, shout out. I, um, I've had a long career in the pharma industry. I've been able and lucky enough to sit in several different roles, so I'll make it quick. Um, most of the time was spent in R&D, so in, in the, if you were in procurement, it could be one of your business partners, right? So I've seen that view from the inside uh, of a pharma company. I've also worked running a a uh, scientific and clinical procurement organization for oh, about four and a half years at Sanofi and uh, got to see the view of managing the outside world from a sponsor side. And then for the last five years, I've been at first PPD, which was acquired then, and now I'm a part of Thermo Fisher Scientific, working across their groups. Um, on the other side, in a commercial organization, so if I only knew all that I know now, <laughs> <laughs> when I was in procurement, um, it would be very, very impactful, right? So for me, it's really sharing back with the uh, colleagues here and, and other women in procurement, you know, giving you an edge. What's the edge that you can have that helps lift you up to show up the way that you're going to have an impact for your organization, whatever the organization is, and giving you the courage and the confidence to be yourself and do that. Because we do know, and why it's important to me is we know there's a lot of pressure around us, right? When you're in procurement and um, it comes from all different angles and being able to, you know, talk about that, build ourselves up. We can try to drive the change from the top down, but, you know, we've been talking about that for a long time. Um, sometimes this uh, get, creating a ground roots effort and making the change there not only for ourselves, but for new entrants into procurement, um, specifically women, but all new entrants, I think we can drive a change there and, and it may be more sustainable in the end. 
Um, so that's why I'm here and excited to be with you. Perfect. Thank you so much. And 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 I think a really interesting point there around the the organizational level that needs to be engaged to be able to initiate and really drive change and understanding, you know, we we may all sit here and expect it to kind of happen above, but actually to be part of that conversation and part of the dialogue. And on that point, Tanya and, and Charmaine, really interested to hear your thoughts and, and, and I suppose expand your thinking a little bit further around not only your experiences, but what his, what impact of those experiences had on your careers and, and linking that back to actually being able to identify how things can be improved and changed moving forward. Do you want me to go <laughs> first? Go ahead, Sherman, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You, I went first. <laughs> no problem. And I do want to encourage people to engage and Absolutely. bring your experiences and speak up as well, but I'll kick it off. Um, so I think the, the, the type of changes that are needed um, fall into three categories. So um, one of them is what, and we're speaking specifically about procurement here and your impact in your organization. Um, a way to elevate yourself is to study the business model of the suppliers. Because we, unless you've worked in one, you think you know it. I can tell you, I didn't know it. I didn't know how much I didn't know until I came to the other side. And putting a little effort in there will show you an edge. You will have, you know, and even building organizations that hire people, like if you run organizations that hire people from that world. Um, because it gives, it changes the mix of your organization and it allows you to show up as a different kind of leader who can embrace the understanding of another business model. Because our suppliers don't, in the pharma industry, do not work like the developers of medicine. It's a totally different business model. Whether it's products or services, it doesn't really matter. So, so for me, that's one of the most important things is, you know, I, if I could go back, I would have done that. I mean, I thought I was doing it, but obviously not enough, I would have done it even more. Um, and so that's a change we can take on our own, right? It doesn't rely on any senior leader opening the door, but also it will give you an edge. Um, I think ensuring that your financial acumen is very, very tight um, is a change that, and maybe it is, but maybe sometimes we don't show up just because the way we communicate our financial situations, you know, maybe more in our own style. I mean, and you should be able to be yourself, but you need to make sure that you're resonating that financial message um, and to really check yourself on that. Um, so for me, that's the second thing I think we can change ourselves. So these are things we can do. I mean, obviously there's mentoring, all kinds of stuff, but these are things we can do that don't, we don't need permission from anybody, right? We can just start doing it. Um, I think we have to take those kinds of changes. And then I would say, we need to influence the leadership. You know, I don't think it works to just say, oh, we need more women in procurement and oh, we want more women at the top in procurement. I mean, you can say it, but we've been saying we need more CEOs forever and Luke, it just doesn't happen, okay? And when we say we want board seats, okay, they'll throw some board seats. And then when we say we want um, C-suites, the majority, and I'm just generalizing, of the C-suite positions are not, they're more like support functions, okay? So it's not running the business. So we need more CPOs that are women, right? For sure. Um, we need more N minus ones to that level that are women, but how do we make that happen? And I think that's something we should talk about because I don't have the exact answer for it, but I do know that we do need to influence it. Because if you want to drive change, we've got to start to break that that ceiling. On that point, Tanya, around the the, the number of CPOs, and and you know, Luke started off the discussion with the the number of women actually on you know kind of within the top role of of pharma companies. Do you think we can learn from other industries within the pharma sector? Do you think we can can reflect at you know what other industries have done, or or do you think we need to kind of look inwardly first? Well, I think you always should look outside at the different industries to see what the impact could be. 
Um, we're going to have our own different challenges. Um, I think there's some similarities. We probably should consider picking businesses that are in life science or other areas, but not necessarily maybe going to like energy or something crazy, like to the far side, right? Because pharma is very specific and is under a lot of pressure right now. Um, and that, and, and understanding that we pick the market we compare to very carefully. Good idea. Good morning. This is Salani. Hi. Hey. Hi. Um, it's six something AM. Yeah. Six AM in Washington. <laughs> Washington. Um, so I'm not quite camera ready, but I do want to dovetail on something that you mentioned, um, Tanya, if you don't mind me me butting into this. Um, you, you talked about, you know, getting more women in the C-suite or that N minus one level. And, and I'd, want, I'd want to add one more thing. In, in addition to breaking the ceiling, we have to avoid the glass cliff. And mm -hmm. that was a phenomenon that um, I understand, I, I only understood a few years ago, which is when all hell breaks loose, appoint a woman to appease the masses, don't give them the support. And when they fail, say, look, we tried, and then don't try for another 10 years. And I think that's something that is, as a trap we need to fall, we need to avoid falling into so that the very first offer that we receive to get to a CPO position or to that level isn't one that we accept because we have to look at the support system around uh, the probability of success. And if, if the deck is stacked against you, don't jump against, don't jump for that position because we will essentially set the movement back more years than, than is necessary. Interesting. You know, I think when I was making the move into procurement, and some of you guys may remember this, um, that was in that group at the time, uh, I think I was told once that maybe I was a double risk because one, I actually hadn't been in procurement. Two, and I'm coming in at a high level, I'm a woman. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I was so mad, you have no idea. So, so of course I had to control that, but I, I'm sure my face did not. But um, at the same time, I'm like, I don't know how those two went together, right? I could understand the first pretty clearly, right? Where you ha I had to go and get my certified procurement manager. I had to understand the language. And I totally got that. But but what is the risk? You know, why do people think there's a risk? Um, and like you just said, if they didn't think that, what you said would not have would not happen, right? So clearly, there's something blocking there, um, and that's why I focused on the things we can control: our ability to to speak in the financial acumen that we need to speak in. Okay. Also, understand our business, right? Because like, if you don't understand our business, you know, I'll be honest with you: we're in pharma. When I joined procurement, there were people who worked eight years, and I asked, "Well, what is the product you're working on?" And they didn't have the answer. So that's not okay. Like you got to know your business, right? You got to know what you're doing, right? And, and then the other part was, you know, build, build the confidence to speak up, bring your ideas, study the models. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's not just go in and do what the job description says, right? Um, because if you really want to, and honestly, I think you'll make a bigger impact if you do these things. So Talani, it was a good point. And um, we don't want that to occur. Um, remember, just because one woman moves to the top doesn't solve the problem for everybody. That's the first thing. It means to me, I mean, it means nothing. It just means one person was good, got a job and great for them. But it needs to be when we say we have made success and we, this action has caused a shift. It's going to be benefiting many people. It has to be like that. Otherwise, it's um, we're not really making an impact. Charming. Yeah, um, it, education, right? Um, and this is so important. Um, I don't, for me, I don't think women need to do necessarily more. I think women are there. A lot of women are there. I think for me, it's it's about speaking a language that everyone understands. Um, under, do your do your 
your research into um, the history of women, um, the history of feminism. What is it that's holding us back truly? Because I think that is very empowering. I think once you realize it's not just you, it is the system, it's institutionalized discrimination against women, that will empower you to hold a narrative and to, to hold yourself up high and expect rather than trying harder and harder and harder because we've been trying for a long time. So it's about time that we stood up and we said, right, we've been trying, we've got the qualifications, we've been to university, we know our product, we know we have financial acumen. How do we change the organizations that we're in? How do we change the hearts and minds? How do we look at the, the, the cultural norms and, and cultures? Um, how do we speak to HR and ask them to, to put into practices, uh, institutional, uh, institutional practices that address the, the, the privilege that is, that, or lack of privilege um, that, that is against us? Listen, I say this because with racism, it's not caused by a black person. Sexism is not caused by a woman in my book. And so from what I've, what I've done and what I, what I wish I'd done earlier is to, to, to realize that, yeah, I, I have been doing everything that I, I need to be doing. Um, yes, I can improve, everyone can improve. We're not, we're not perfect. Um, but, but to Tanya's point, I mean, it's it really, yeah, we don't just need one woman at the top, right? We need to realize, accept that we are talented and we are good and, um, or excellent. And, and we, we deserve a place. I think that's, uh, that's what, import, what, what is really important for me and, and, and understanding what, um, a microaggression is and having that dialogue. So. Um, when you're, if you're, if you're uh, accused of microaggressing um, a, a privileged person, a male, um, making sure that your leadership understands what is going on there, um, and 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 you're all speaking the same language. Thank you. I think that was a really, really good, good viewpoint, and and I absolutely love the avoid the 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 glass cliff analogy there. I thought that was fantastic. And I think on that note, um, Luke, if we may, I think it, it it seems like a pertinent time now to kind of pull up one of our polls to understand from the group how you've been been challenged personally. So which of the following, I, I say, thank you very much, Luke. So which of the following, looking at the first poll here, have you personally experienced um, within, within the workplace and, and within pharma procurement? Gender pay gap followed by feeling marginalized and lack of female role models in the top three. Yeah. Probably if we asked this three and a half years ago, the other one would have had more votes, but <laughs> okay. But it's changed. Um, let's just take the top one for a second. I mean, it's not, I, if it wasn't 70%, I think I would have been shocked, <laughs> right? Because it's something everybody knows. I mean, I worked in a company, and I'm not naming which one, but I would get a message saying, oh, from the state that you live in, here's the figures for women that were hired and, and we're this is part of our effort. And I'd be like, what are you talking? Like, like that was the effort they took to have some equality and on especially on the on the salaries. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not an effort. That's just like a report out. <laughs> okay. So there was no action. Um, so it really annoyed me more than made me feel reassured that the company was paying attention to salaries in that state that I lived in at the time for, for, for women. Um, it was a checkbox. So, you know, how do you feel about, and we're talking about procurement specifically here, but how do you feel about in your organizations, whether they're checking the box or they're really doing something on that first point? Yeah, it would be fantastic to hear because, you know, this is a, a topic that has been, you know, kind of top, top of HR's agenda for, for a reasonable amount of time, yet still seems 
incredibly visible and you know felt by all of us they really would welcome comments and, and views of, of how your organizations have been tackling this um and and what more do you think could be done within this area to 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 to, to reduce and eliminate that gap yeah so, so do you think the to, question is do you think your company is actually acting on that or just reporting on it and, and I'd encourage you to think about things like sponsorship and allyship of women, um, putting women forward. Does that happen with your, within your, anyone's organization? The sisterhood? <laughs> I mean, this is Kara. I was just gonna say, I, I don't think I can speak to my current organization or any share any immediate feedback, but I just think general trends I've observed over my time and experience in the workforce is, I do feel <clears throat> like tying back a little bit into the previous conversation around data, I do think like encouraging open conversation around pay um, and then also the ranges that are being posted in job descriptions these days by certain state laws and things like that. I think it will help to make the topic less taboo to talk about. Um, and I think that will encourage more movement in that direction. Um, I think just in general, I think what you had said, Charmaine, about like education and bringing data to that table, I think there's a lot of stigma that comes from old bureaucratic ways of working in the workforce. And I think the more we could bring data to the table to highlight why maybe some of those stigmas are incorrect, I think it would really help to help to shift those tides. So that's an, a really important point, um, Karik. I mean, you could you. Could, uh, you in order to address a problem, you need to know what the problem is. And data helps you to understand what the problem is um, and how how big that problem is. Mm. Um, but it's it's getting getting that data, getting that that um, those figures to be measured. And um, I know at Bayer we we well Bayer Basel. Uh, I'm based in Basel. We we did a, a survey on on um, on pay the pay gap. And uh, um, and it was an independent organisation that, that did come in and, and check, and uh, and we passed. So that was uh, that was that was great. But there are a lot of organisations, a lot of pharmaceutical companies where they wouldn't. And um, and and I'm not saying that uh, just because we passed in Basel, we passed in every single country. I don't know that, but um, but for Basel, we 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 were successful. Do you know if you passed in procurement in Basel? In the whole organisation. You yeah. don't know the breakdown, okay. Okay. Yeah, no, no, they don't. They don't provide that. Um, so, so, so men, and women, it, it, men and women within the within the organisation. Yeah. So, so what you were just mentioning, Charmaine and Tanya, the point you were alluding to is exactly the challenge. So, Cara, thank you for bringing up data, but we ha we are subject to many of these institutional metrics. Mm. Here is how we compare in the organisation. No country metrics, maybe sometimes, no level metrics, and certainly no functional metrics. And to, to the point, I, I answered all the questions in the survey. I think it's really important that we shore up our support systems, but then also stand up and be counted by asking the right questions, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about gender pay gap, it's not just advocate because if we start off with I want to know the difference between pay gap and you know men and women we're going to be shot down almost immediately right but here is the question what level of data and transparency is HR willing to give us at this point in time because I want to assess that for my people and want to encourage my boss to assess that for his or her people and and it starts with those like us being good ambassadors and good advocates sort of encourages other people to do the same because when by the time they come to the realization that this is action they can take it's yeah. you know you're already there and you we always want to be leading the way and I think that that's the point Tanya you were making which is we can't just be good but we have to be smart about the ways that we advocate for ourselves Mm -hmm. and also show up as leaders, right? And that, that's where we start. Okay, I want to see the data. If you can't send it to me, can you screenshot it? Can you flash it up on a screen? But how, we need to get down to the level of detail 
so that I, as a leader, can see and advocate for my people and my team. Um, and then maybe encourage others to do the same or even influence others to do the same or shame them, whichever one fits. <laughs> love it, Talani, love it. Um, so just to go a little further, give you a personal example. I think when you become someone, a leader that actually hires people, right? You also have a role there because if you don't stick up and challenge the salary of the people you're, make sure that it's equitable when you're hiring them. And I'm spe speaking mostly of women, but I mean, general, anybody really, but also fairly to women. Um, then that's our fault because we're, we should be doing that. It's interesting because when I started to act on that and pay attention to it in my organization, I never got a no, never got a no. When I, when I said, but I want to push it to this level because of the qualification, because of, you know, I explained the talent, I explained it all. Like you said, the person was ready. This is where, this is where the market, this is where this person needs to come in on the market. Um, I fought against it. I actually ended up not getting, I mean, if it, you can't go above the ranges of the levels, so you can't be like totally nuts, but you know, you got to fight against that HR beast. That's like, on your back, okay, and the and the finance budgets and the things like that, and um, I think that I started to advocate and fight a little harder in the hiring process, and I think that was my. It felt good to be able to act there, right? It felt good during the yearly reviews to be able to really look at it because before I just looked at everybody and I never looked at that angle. I'm just being honest. I didn't like focus on that angle. And I started to do that years ago. And I saw, even in my own organization, problems. And then I started to fix them. So we can definitely do that. We can definitely do that as because many of us have run teams. We're not all you know expert contributors. So if we're not, if you're not realizing your own organization and bias, then um, you know, that's that's kind of hard to point to others. So I just highlight that as a shared experience that happened to me. I love that. I, I love the fact that you've mentioned affirmative action because nothing really happens unless you really um, take affirmative action, right? If you just left it to uh, to, to to nature, um, this is where we end up uh, with gender um, gender pay gaps and 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 um, the glass ceiling and so on. Um, the, the, I can speak for, on behalf of kind of Bayer in terms of the journey that we're going through and we have been through, and it's it's been um a journey of awareness building. And so before you can ask the questions of, um, to, to, to Talani's point, asking questions about the data, there needs to be an awareness building within the organization, within the procurement organization. So what we, what we did um, with the support of the CPO, and so you start at the top, get the top support to, um, to set up a, a, a DE&I um, procurement advocacy group. And we had done that and we'd created a group called um, Swell, so Stronger with Inclusion, Respect and Love. And you would not believe how difficult it was to get the word love in there, right? <laughs> and so we, we advocated for women. Uh, we, we asked um, for, for videos we made, for awareness building. We, we went to different parts of the organization to, to talk about uh, um, uh, the, the history of feminism, um, the... Um, the glass ceiling and what it meant, um, empathy uh, kind of um, session group to increase empathy uh, towards women. Um, and, and we've had some really, really great results. And that has allowed us as a procurement organization to look at not necessarily pay, but grade and gender parity when it comes to grade and putting in affirmative action to make sure we get gender parity at each managerial level. And so that has been very rewarding and, and, and has been um, even pointed out in our voice surveys. So when we, we have surveys related to how, how, um, how the organization, the organization believes um, how inclusive we are, that score has been going up. So it's a real tangible metric. The next stage is to look at salary, I guess, as a, as a procurement organization globally. 
Um, I know in 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 Basel um, we we we're okay, but in procurement globally, um, how does the do the salaries compare? But um, there's a really good point. I I, I um, there's Dr. Livingston, I think his name is Dr. Robert Livingston, and he wrote a book called Power and Privilege, and uh, and he talks about how nothing changes unless there is affirmative action, unless you sit back and you say, right, when I do hire. Am I going to have to, to, to make an effort to make sure that I get an equal number of responses from women and that I will give a chance to a woman, that I will support a woman, I will be an ally towards a woman and I will sponsor a woman. So when she's not in the room, I will speak on their behalf and elevate their, their voice. Yeah. Just going back to the point around... <clears throat> Hey, and, and I think there's some really good points there around the visibility of data, you know, and, and really being able to harness data in quite a powerful way. What are people's views on, on the, the, the changing or the generational change when it comes to transparency and openness around salary? You know, I know I'm, I'm a um, kind of middle-aged British woman. It, it's, you know, absolutely no way would I feel comfortable talking about that but if I look at some of the um you know kind of my junior colleagues that are working their way up the organization you know they they are little powerhouses they have absolutely no concern raising the point around what they're on understanding what their colleagues are on and really fighting their you know kind of their their, their, their platform do we really you know, keen to understand if, if if we think you know yes absolutely we need that affirmative action but also removing that that stigma attached to oh no gosh I couldn't possibly talk about my salary and actually putting it out there you know one, once it's there once it's visible do we think that that's going to help the situation as as well of you know really being able to to put that on the the kind of top list of people's actions yeah so um, there's different benefits and negative sides of that that dilemma. The benefit would be whoever you talk to, you'd know their salary. But the rate, unfortunately, the companies have done such broadbands and ranges. Mm. It's a it's a tricky thing. Um, it's also like when someone comes to me and tells me, and I'm just being honest, um, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman um, because I don't see it differently. Oh, so and so makes this much, and I only make this much, and I need a raise. That's not a reason to get a raise. Okay. So, you know, there's performance, there's many other things, right? Uh, years of experience, there's all kinds of the level of impact you're having in the organization. Um, so, that usually doesn't work in my experience. What works is more being educated about where you are in your range, in the range, and where you want to be. Um, instead of comparing to other people, you're comparing to the, the framework that you got to work in because the whole point is we wanted to be equal in the range and in the band and, or the level or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, that we are hired for. Um, so we don't want to be in that low end. <laughs> we want to be in the higher end because if we do that, then we are reaching what we want. Um, so that's how I think about it. Uh, at the same time, the higher you get in your range, the less raises you get. I mean, it's just the system, okay? So when you to understand, and if you don't get a promotion, then the system, it's, it's a system and it's men have to deal with the system too. It's not a system on women. Our biggest problem is when we get hired or when we actually change a job because we, I think, don't fight enough. We don't ask for the same salaries that others would ask for it. And you might apply that to the younger generation because yes, they're very aggressive <laughs> in that request. I mean, I've hired someone who within less than six months asked me for a 5% raise and they hadn't delivered anything. But wow, you know, at least they asked. And I remember mentoring women who wanted promotions and wanted increases. And I said, well, have you asked for it? And they're like, no, they should give it to me. I'm like, no, you have to ask for it. So, <laughs> so like it, it's both ways. So I just wanted to, that's my thought on it. It's just something, you know, it doesn't mean I'm right. I just sharing what I, what I've experienced. Honestly, with you, uh, if I may speak, uh, this is Marilyn speaking, I think that this benchmark analysis are very, very important. 
take example, for example, Germany, okay? Now, Germany is very old school kind of mindset thinking. But even now, there is one web page actually on Facebook and people there are, are actually revealing their salary. You have, for example, the electrician going there, revealing his salary, the bartender, the waitress. Mm -hmm. And you can see that people actually appreciate it. They even said, oh my God, that's amazing. Now I know that I'm actually underpaid or that I'm actually yes. okay with my salary, you know, because they did not know before. And I can see that these barriers are changing. And I think that they should be changing and these data should be official because we are procurement, right? And for example, when you're negotiating with your suppliers, you also do your benchmark analysis. So why we cannot apply it in our personal life as well? I think that this data should be a mandatory for every PO or HR department in the company and they should give it to all the associates so they know how well they are actually paid. Yeah, I, I think mean, that's a great point. Something. You're supposed to be able to get your range. They are. I mean, I have never when I ask for it, I've never got a no. I've always gotten the range. I know where I am in the range. I don't know if that's true in all companies, but um, I agree with you. I love that attitude where we got to educate. You know, we got to know whether we should be happy with the salary or not. <laughs> okay. Right. Right. And I think. Um, I think Oh, sorry. I think to that point, though, um, I think from a, a leadership perspective as well, right, one of the, the asks of leaders is to differentiate. So when it comes to annual reviews, you we have to differentiate. Well, I want to differentiate and I want to reward my higher performers. Now, depending on how long they've been performing highly in a role, how long somebody has come in, I think... I, I agree with, with, with what was stated, but I want to add that caveat, right? It works when you get into a role to understand what your range is in. But I think we have to very quickly pivot to looking at what is our performance like? What are we adding to the table to justify those increases? Because we have to almost give ourselves permission to think like the leader. And say, so, okay, what if I were to differentiate, what would I do? If you were you have kids, I don't, but I'm assuming if you have kids and you know one does a chore, you have a reward system. Here's what the chores are. You clean your room, you get X. You clean my room, then you know, we might go to a restaurant for dinner <laughs> because that's worthy of the effort, right? <laughs> so, I want to be your child. <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly. But so those, I mean, I, I'm being facetious in a way, but um, I think it's really important to also educate on the components of a pay increase and how those are done and how those are done fair. I think it's, it really needs to be, it can't just be, let's now get all the data out. Because if you're just coming into an industry, there's no way you have the, the kudos or the credentials to to demand a higher salary. And I wouldn't want to overpay somebody to come into an industry either. No, I, I think that's a, a really, really good point. And